Hi, uh, this is Nick and Matt. We've we've just recorded the podcast that you're about to listen to, um, and it blatantly occurs as there probably ought to be a content warning on the front of it. What, what did we talk about, Matt? So we're talking about mental health, abuse, um, sexual abuse, and the effect of that, which is pretty honest, actually. And mm. um, but that can have its own issues kind of yeah you if, depending on where you are in your own mental health journey this may not be a thing that you're ready to listen to which is cool um if you think you might not be don't listen come back to it later or listen to it a bit and then stop um <laughs> great <laughs> advice <laughs> i don't i don't know i don't know i don't know how much is too I think much the pause button has never been more useful in pause history one, great yeah, yeah. Use, use pause uh and then delete yeah. use your own discretion for listening to this episode and remember if you need help it's available. Go and talk to a mental health professional. Talk to your friends. It will help. This is We Are What We Overcome. What you're about to hear are the ramblings and reflections of three ordinary people, drawing on their own personal and occasionally professional experiences. These conversations are unprepared, subjective, and should not be taken as medical advice or instruction. Anyone seeking help should always carry out their own research, or better yet, speak to a professional about their circumstances. Speak to my beautiful library. I look forward to filling that up with Lego. Mm. There's this picture of yourself. It seems to have a lot of cameras on the back and lenses. Mm. Fancy. Do you, know, uh, do you want to know a really bad reason why, one of the reasons why I bought it? Is it because it was matte black? No, because <laughs> that's a good, it's not matte black though. It's, it's, <laughs> I, I would love to know the reason why, what, the, the shit reason was for buying it. Because uh, the selfie camera is much better quality now. <laughs> <laughs> My selfie camera is terrible. Don't need those, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'll only knock the other one over. Hmm. I, I've started the timer. <coughs> oh. <laughs> We're on! All right. <laughs> We Are What We Overcome on this occasion features musician Matt McGuinness, improviser Nick Tyler, and psychotherapist Wes Evans. Sit back, enjoy, and remember, it's good to talk. What are we calling this episode? Um, Nick's sad past. Um, Nick's sad past. Nick, that's, that's too grim, isn't it? Um, we haven't got, this is the entitled one. Uh, what about like, like reflections on counselling? It's a bit wank, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> It is. Like, okay. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to We Are What We Overcome. We finally got rid of that counsellor for a month, which is great because then oh. we can say what we like, can't we, Nick? <laughs> yes. Uh, he won't cruelly police our words. No, uh, with all his professional words, smithery, whatever it's called. You can't say that. I'm sick of him saying that. It's anyway. very useful and soothing. Yeah, well, I'm, I, th- I, actually, I, I genuinely think we're going to miss him on this we one. We do miss him, don't we? <laughs> he, he had a certain something, doesn't he? So this is uh, a bit of a different episode. Um, and we're going to have, we're trying to think of a title for it, and I thought we should call it Untitled, because that's kind of... It's a terrible title. Cool, man. isn't it? Mm. No, that's um, dreadful. Nick, do you want to say what your thoughts on uh, I, I was going to go Reflections on Counselling. Yeah, that's brilliant. I was just saying how supportively, how great Thank that you. was. Yeah, yeah. But let's not call it that. Uh, but we could do, we could do. How about Untitled slash Nick's Reflections on Counselling? Great. Let's go with that. I'm yeah. not going to write any of that in the podcast feed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So uh, we normally check in. This is going to be a bit of a quicker check in, isn't it? Well, because it's just the two of us. Uh, yeah. So she, you go first. How all are right. you feeling? Uh, I'm all right. I'm. Uh, we're currently sitting in my finally completed library, uh, which has been uh, mentioned occasionally over the past nine months, um, and it's become a lovely cocoon of happiness and books, which. Uh, feels apt and useful. I'm in a good place. I'm looking forward to a bank holiday weekend. I've been very, very busy. I've done a lot of things. And I've also spent weeks digging through the junk that I hoard obsessively. Uh, I was just talking about the tins of bits of glass and metal that I've been throwing away. (laughs) But I've also been uh, playing through reams of paperwork, uh, including some of the stuff that we're going to talk about today. So it's been... An emotional few weeks of stuff, and so this feels like a good idea right now. <laughs> the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> James Dean said a similar thing in the fifties. Indeed, yeah. Well, how Let's about go you? for a drive. Oh, hmm. How about you, Matt? Uh, I'm I'm pretty good, I think. I uh, I was. Uh, it's been a bit of a similar sort of two days there. You're probably not on the same to the same level, but mm. I've been going through the scripts of 
doing another show next week, so I haven't done it for a while. Excellent. Off to Bonnie's Scotland. I shouldn't say that, should I? That sounds, uh, I'm off to Edinburgh. That's where I'm going to. Which is in Scotland. It so is in fine. Scotland. Um, and so that'll be good. But it's obviously, I haven't looked at the script for a while and you mm. forget how uh, much it affects you. Uh, and hopefully it'll affect them as well. But we shall see. I'm sure it will. But now I'm good. That is good. You seem quite worn out when you arrived. So you perked up with talking. It's maybe. always good to uh, for us to get together, isn't it? So uh, it I, is. I think nice. that helps a lot. All right. All right, then. Um, how are we going to start this? You... I, f- I feel like we should start with a content warning okay. more than anything else. Um, this might not be very good. Is that what you mean? Or? Yeah. This, yeah, this okay. is going to be no good. It's me reading. Um, my background is as a sexual abuse survivor. So um, we're going to be talking about uh, some of my the things that I wrote while I was in counselling. Uh, after when I was in counselling, I used to write. I used to get very drunk and write after the sessions. Uh, that was how I like coped with it and processed the stuff that we covered and talked about. Um, so we're going to be talking about that. So it's going to be it's going to be about sexual abuse and being in counselling for that sort of thing. Um, not I can't actually remember how explicit some of it is. There might be swearing if I'm going to read it verbatim. Mm-hmm. I will attempt to self censor. So I guess, so ten years ago or ten uh, eleven years ago. Um, I had a kind of resurgence of realisation that I was abused as a teenager, which is super weird as a thing to forget, because you wouldn't think you'd just forget. But it turns out you can. Um, and I drifted through university and into like real life after that without really remembering what had happened, or not in a way that it was affecting like my day-to-day um, existence or my brain too much. And one of the things that I think triggered it was What's it coming back was read it as I used to work at probation and we had to read a load of sex offender files for whatever reason. Um, and I couldn't realise why it was so like upsetting to read at the time. Obviously, it's horrible stuff to read. So if you're not upset by it a little bit, there's probably something wrong with you. But it was definitely like, jarring me out of myself. Um, I don't know if anyone else had that sensation where you're reading or saying or doing something and you can feel like your inner core vibrating out of your physical bodies, if you like, physically separating into two different things. Um, very sort of dissonant sensation. I get that occasionally. Usually it was when I've massively screwed something up or something else has happened that is more significant than I realise. It's a useful physical cue, I guess. Um, and that experience of reading all that stuff basically got my brain ticking over again and it was then slowly tied together why I didn't sleep and hadn't really slept for years and why I was drinking and smoking so much and hadn't been able to separate out or process it. Um, so I dug out some of my old dream diaries because I used to keep a diary as a kid, as a teenager. Um, and ooh, they're horrible reading. Um, they're very old. We're not going to read those. <laughs> not least I can't read my own handwriting. That would be a disaster for everybody. So I try and uh, read this sort of spidery scroll of nightmare. Um, but it was very bad. And my sleep was terrible. And eventually uh, I got bullied by my other half into going to the doctors for sleep disorder and stuff. And they put me on to CBT, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, like a course of uh, telephone counseling sessions, which was really good, except that I was doing them in the middle of the day at work. Which is great. So like twelve till two I, on a, like a Thursday or whenever I would ring my counselor and we would talk about all sorts of stuff and I'd go back to work. <laughs> it was great. So the the, the first one I want to read is um while I was doing that C B T with a wonderful counsellor. I don't I don't recall her name. It's very bad of me, but she was great. Um so this one starts starts quite hard. It's quite short. So I would have written this at lunchtime before returning to my, <laughs> my office job. <laughs> Literally walking from my boss office back into the main room where all the desks are. Was this all on the computer? The typing? Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I gave up writing anything by hand years ago because it's just a disaster for everyone. Um, all right, yeah. Let's see how it goes. Feel free to interrupt, Matt, with that. <laughs> if it makes no sense. Um, if you I've just told my brain lady that I was abused as a teenager. That's, that's a true thing. I don't think I've ever been able to just say it to someone like that before. So I feel kind of shocked. At our last session, I'd managed to say that there were more things than the sleep disorder and depression that I wanted to get help with. I knew that at some point I'd have to elaborate on the intricate obfuscation I'd woven and say something more. For some reason, probably the usual like mental tricks of deflection, I hadn't clicked that it would be so soon. So when my brain lady asked me about it today, I was a bit flustered. I have thought about it a lot. 
but going forwards and doing a thing, not really about why I needed to go forward. I am an idiot. I don't think I could have prepared for it though, and it's weird writing it again here because I've confessed the things that have happened to me on paper and shared that with some of my loved ones, but to actually say them out loud took a lot. But once I'd said I was abused as a teenager, I found that I could talk about it a little. Knowing that we weren't about to launch into that real deep details helped, because obviously it's the missing link when I've thought about self-harm and depression. And so talking about it makes more of my life make sense, even to me. And I, I know that in theory somewhere down there, I know that already, but we hide this stuff from ourselves. I did feel obliged, as I always do, to say that it wasn't awful. I wasn't abducted or anything, and millions have suffered far worse. But, you know, it happened to me, and that's significant enough for me. The scale, I always imagine, is a way of normalising or gaining perspective on my own experience. But however minor it may have been compared to someone else's experience, doesn't really matter, because it's a kind of self-denial, minimising the value and the worth of how I feel. And writing like this helps me to explore how I feel, and I get to see it and look at it like I would do any other piece of writing and criticise it. I mean, I'm not checking for spelling and grammar. Uh, it's, it's very bad. And while I'm writing, I'm starting to find the answers to questions that I asked my brain lady and I asked myself about the purpose of pursuing treatment for something that happened so long ago, which I'd survived. The mere fact that I'm writing about it at all, and worse, scarcely managing to even say it, makes it pitifully obviously why I need to take action. That it scares me, freezes my tongue, turns me instinctively. These are such clear indications to me. I've hidden from myself for too long. I'm not sure I like it out here yet. I will allow myself a shudder of tears. I realise that this is a big deal and it's not been easy. And I'm torn in my chest and I don't know what this is going to be like. But now I've got to go back to work. <laughs> and then I would go back to work after that. It was... Did you write that straight after speaking to them? Yeah. So that, that would probably have been on my boss's computer as well. Oh, <laughs> and then wow. emailed it to myself. <laughs> and did... Did... did um... You said before that um, you uh, it was work that made you start thinking about it again and mm. bring it out. So was that like gradual or? Yeah, and it's it's very hard to put in place. I think I think it's it's that combined with we got into the habit of watching Law and Order Special Victims Unit. Right. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's good drama, but it's every single episode is about horrible things happening, and I wonder if there was a that is drawn to it. You know, there, there's something here that I need to have re-shown to myself in order to be able to grasp it cognitively that stuff existed and happened and I need to look at it again. But no, it was it was a, it was a slow thing and it was useful because it, it gave context to everything else that was going on. You know, I just hadn't slept since, really since I was like 14 properly and I'd been drinking so for years. Um, very supportive friends and stuff, but just been a, you know, a real mess for a decade and a half two decades, I don't know, decade and a half, and hadn't really known why. It's very odd when you, someone starts basically posting you the answers in like a sort of cryptic puzzle. I'm not very good at puzzles, so it took ages. Did you get to the point where you... Because you said um, in the whether I got it wrong, that you it was easiest to say something out loud because it wasn't going to go into any sort of detail or something. Like that. Oh, so, yeah, that, that's, that's probably context for like that, that session, you know, we'd, because in, in the previous one, I, I'd said to my counsellor, look, I'm talking in circles. Um, I'm plainly avoiding what I want to talk about. And I can't talk about it yet, but I want to make clear that I'm avoiding talking about the thing that I want to talk about. So, you know, we'd kind of agreed that we would, whatever it was I wanted to talk about but didn't want to talk about, we would talk about but not in tons of detail. And that was right. kind of freeing. I guess like saying a bad thing happened it doesn't really commit you to having to go into it. And that was the first time you said it out loud. Mm. Yeah, I think with other people, I'd, I'd like written it down and kind of <laughs> held up the paper, <laughs> which seems which it seems kind of silly. But and do you think you you, you said it to a professional because you knew they weren't going to ask the questions, and whereas if you'd told it to someone who's close to you, they'd probably have I don't know thousands of questions. I think it's not so much the questions because people close to me, you know, had had known like you know, I'd shared it like on paper with you know partners and some family members, but we hadn't talked about it in detail. You know, I used to, one of the things I used to use the diary to write for was that I would then 
give that to my partner at the time. Like, this is where I am. <laughs> this is what's happening in my head as a way of, I guess, being honest, but also avoiding talking about it. But vocalizing it makes everything real, which is strange mm-hmm. in a way that being written doesn't. It's, you know, it's, 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 there's loads of things I could say, which I do. <laughs> but one of the things that comes across when you're reading that is just your character completely. I mean, it's one of the main things about you. You underplay things that happen to you in in, in a way that I, I don't know anyone else that does, to be honest. You know, it's like you seem to be able to contextualise it and, and compare and contrast. And I don't, I don't know if it's good. I mean, I think, like I said in that, yeah, it's also a way of minimising it. And and you know undervaluing it, you know I can I can take the wind out of my own sails, I guess. But it wasn't that bad, really. It's fine, but does, it just diminishes it. It doesn't. And although it's it's like a survival strategy, I think. Um, you know, you say, oh, it wasn't that bad. It's cool because it still makes other people not worry as much, and it means that then I don't have to talk about it. And in theory, that can tell me that it's not so bad, but it doesn't actually resolve anything. It's just it's just another way of skipping past it merrily without dealing with it. Mm. But do you know that other people listen to it won't have the same thing at all with that? It's yeah, I don't like, know. I'm, I'm, well, if if you say what you said then, and then you said, but it, you know, it wasn't that bad. I haven't even thought, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> well, but I mean, there aren't things. You know, this true. I don't, I don't truly care about a, everybody else at this well, stage. It's about you, isn't it? You know. Sure, I know. Yeah, and I appreciate that. But yeah, you know, uh, but we, we have to exist in context with everybody else, don't we? Yeah, you know, we there is a, there is a scale of things that happen. You know, some people are happier than others, and that that's okay. But it's still like, however, how happy you are still yeah. matters. You're just not as happy as someone else. I guess. Yeah, I don't I just, know where that's going. Yeah, no, I just I've just other thought. You know, you get it, one leg chopped off, and you immediately say to the ambulance person, "Don't worry, the left's still working." Oh, delightfully! <laughs> are, are you aware of the works of Voltaire? There's an amazing <laughs> book called Candide, uh, which is uh, it's a character who all the worst things happen to him, but he's convinced that he lives in the best of all possible worlds. Right. So even when his leg does get cut off, and he goes like nearly drowns where he's like yeah that was really bad but you know this is the best of all possible worlds so imagine <laughs> what it's like in all the others yeah. you know this is this is top notch stuff and I, I think maybe I internalised that as a teenager because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that as, a, as an approach do you want to read something else yeah definitely ah oh, time things alright uh, so there's I've got a bunch of things and one of the reasons I wanted to do this partly because I'm digging through tons of stuff at the moment and it's been weird and interesting and I haven't really dug through all of this but I have I've had my old dream diaries out and I I, I have all the letters from my abuser amongst other things um, and photos of them and all this sort of stuff which I haven't gone back through but one of the things I did when I got beyond CPT and spent some time with ISIS which is uh, Inness in, in, my god everything with the naive is, is internet isn't it it's not it's uh, incest and sex abuse survivors network and they did i think we did eight or 12 weeks very intensive um and i'd chosen to like rather than take it easy i, I was like yeah i'm doing this for a reason and so i used it to grind through all of the letters and all of the dream diary all of the diary entries um in order um Rather than try and do anything else, I just wanted to get through them because I hadn't looked at them for years. It's like this will be this will be awful. So if I do this with someone's support, even if they're just sitting in the corner just watching me do it and pushing a box of tissues towards me, that's quite a nice sort of supportive environment. So we did some of that, and there are a lot of bunch of different stages. Um, my memory is very badly fractured, um, and part of that is a sort of a post traumatic thing. Yeah, it just wipes your memory out, not just of what happened, but of the the years surrounding it is like shattered into order that makes no sense. And so we did a bunch of things, one of which was trying to put together like a timeline, which was interesting. And so I've written some stuff about trying to understand what it is to be upset by something that you can't remember, which is weird. Um, so what, what I've tried to pull out is a bunch of different entries that partly express what it's like to be in counselling here. Yeah. Because it's not easy to understand when you haven't done it, because it's not lying on a couch. It's not it's lying on a couch screaming. But you know, it's it's not it's not Doctor Freud, yeah. which I guess would be bad actually. Um, so this is this is probably like three weeks into oh, oh, last month, four weeks. That's useful into like really intense counselling. 
I, I could give it a good title, actually. Putting the past into the picture. Oh, wow. I love titles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've not noticed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, final description, you can, you can avoid worrying about it. Um, during the last month of counselling, I found myself pretty traumatised and upset by the details which I couldn't recall and the things that I've rediscovered. It's not been easy for me or for anyone unlucky enough to spend much time with me. Compiling a timeline to give myself reference points and really start to understand what actually happened has felt very important, although I've typically minimised its importance and my desire to compile one. So that, that didn't change. Uh, score one for prevarication. Regardless, some common sense has won out, and through my diary entries, some help from my dad, and apply application of some logic, it's starting to come together. I have to accept that through my own choices in the past, there are areas that will never become clear. There are others where I've chosen to record quite useful information of thoughts and decisions. And that's the danger with diaries. They're self-edited, self-censored, and potentially full of lies by omission and intent. We create history as we go along. It's not awesomely helpful. Anyway, the work on my time was aided by a few hours with a lot of whiskey going through my diaries from when I was at sixth form. It's the only period of my life I've ever attempted to keep track of, in part because I was being hit by these bewilderingly vivid dreams which struck me as worthy of record, and that eventually became a record of my mental states during those two years. I've intentionally not returned to them for many years. In fact, they've been tied up in a bundle inside a lockbox for about the last decade. In starting to review them during counselling wasn't pleasant. Some of it's hilarious in a wistful kind of way. There's nothing like the pretentious profundity of teenagers. You know, it's like the thing that we romanticise endlessly in film and literature. And I discovered there's relatively little about Rick in them. Rick is uh, my abuser. I wasn't sure whether I was going to use his name. I guess I am, because <laughs> fuck him. Um, it's apparent there's so little because I literally could not express how I felt. As a fairly articulate guy, even then, my frustration and painful rage is so tangible when I do manage to write about him and I can see it in the handwriting which declines below its you know, normal poor legibility into just nothing I still haven't read them in full just skim them with an averted eye looking for dates and trying to match facts to the timeline I've marked them all up so I can find them easily and avoid them when I'm looking for something else oh, the timeline is endless um, basically the dates the, the things that I've put in that, I, that feel like relevance it sort of begins with like my parents splitting up because one of the things that was clear was I was vulnerable and this is the thing with predators predators find people who are vulnerable in vulnerable situations and so I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what dates these things happened so basically 88 my parents split up 90 I started living with my dad my 90 my dad late that same year we first meet this guy Rick when he's a lodger with my ex-stepsisters which is a complicated family um, and then after that, it just gets more and more, more and more involved. He moves within a year to be like half a mile away from us, founds a youth theatre thing the next year that I spend a lot of time doing it with him and, and you know, I'm involved in. And during that time is when a lot of the abuse happened that I, I, I don't have dates for. It just doesn't exist. I don't even try to figure out that it's between like 91 and 93, I guess, most of it. But then I have all these bits. I, t I turned 15. Uh, Rick moves to Amsterdam. We exchange letters. I have a bad falling out in like 94. And I'm in a close relationship at the same time. Then I go and see Rick. Just in Amsterdam. Like, which is 100% like, what the hell? I still can't really understand what I was thinking. And that's when it all gets very bad. Um, and then I have like accounts of that stuff after that. And it's such a confusing mess. And there's, uh, there's a lot of stuff in it that doesn't sound relevant, but I'm increasingly thinking it is because, you know, all of it's tied together. And when you're talking about predatory child abusers, it's important to see the bigger picture. How could I possibly be a victim? Well, I can increasingly see that far from my current go-fuck-yourself aura of self-confidence, I was a very vulnerable, at times very lonely kid. And that's what these people prey upon. I had a genuine need for an interesting friend who would make me feel good about myself and tell me about interesting things. <laughs> that's sort of what I got February 95 was the tipping point before then there was this year of peace except for letters which dealt with separately in counselling and before that two years in which the rest of the molestation took place I don't have any diary records for that period and I don't imagine how I can ever piece it together I may if I feel tough enough write down every instance I can recall though without dates or surety that they're separate or complete 
And though it takes me a while to write about, I distinctly recall clawing at my own skin in horror, being unable to sleep and physically racked with horror. I remember snapping the razor blades out of disposable razors with a penknife and a compass. And, of course, I've got the scars. They're not too many. I remember cutting and hoping it would bleed through my clothes and that someone could stop me and ask me if I was all right. Then I could collapse and break down in tears and let it all come flooding out. It never happened. Eventually, I had to explain to a friend at the time because I was just not the same person when I came back from Amsterdam. I got out of the instant decline of awful self-harm and depression by burying myself in a relationship. And from my diary, I can see that was also an incredibly stressful relationship, as well as being quite marvellous. And I'm clearly fighting back, making choices to affirm who I am at heart away from what's happened to me. I don't yet know what choices I made by myself, as opposed to those I was compelled towards. Whatever happened worked for a while. I got lost in love and A-levels, and then I got to university, got buried in drink and drugs, and then love again. But then it all came back. And that's one of the things I need to figure out next. Where does it go? Why does it come back? Does it ever really go away? Them's of words. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I find it really difficult to, to uh, pull me. Um, to uh, just, there's loads of things I want to chat with you about. <laughs> you know? But there's some really interesting things. I'm, I'm trying to work out the whole timeline, how that mm. helps, you know, how, how, how does that... Uh, is it because you want a complete picture of it? Is that the thing? Or? It's even a partial picture because so, all, all I had was remembering some bad stuff happened in Amsterdam and that, oh yeah, a load of bad stuff happened earlier that would really upset me at the time, but I didn't say anything or go away because I had, I had this kind of cool, interesting older friend and, you know, all the stuff that, you ever hear like the cliches of, you know, well, don't say anything because you're know, special friends, you know, other people won't understand. All absolutely happened. You know, all that, all that's all part of it. And so it's just lost. I don't, I, I, until trying to like literally date out when things happened, I, I couldn't have placed even the years that they took place in. Mm. I've got just scattered memories from sort of 12 to 15. Yeah, there's bits of being at school, there's bits of being at home, but I've got no kind of linear detail for any of it because I was on I guess by that point about four hours sleep a night and it all it's all just gone so trying to place these flashes and glimpses of memory back into some kind of date order felt really important because otherwise it's just a mass of stuff yeah. you're like I, I guess some things happen man and you can't do anything with it but if I can at least go right my first year at senior school whatever what do we call it in this country high school high school what do high we call it here is it? That is. What do we call it? A secondary school. Thank you. Right. Secondary. All right. Cool. I don't know, watch too much American TV. Yeah, I can go like. So my first year, probably cool. Year seven, that was probably all right. Year eight onwards, less good. But if I can at least like divide out the bits where people weren't there and stuff couldn't have been bad, then I can maybe try and isolate the good from the bad or the bad from the good. I don't know. Hmm. Do you ever come to the point where you just wanted to set fire to a lot of it? And... Yeah, but I'm a really brutal hoarder. Um... I'm not <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, I, I, mm. I, I, I do find it in your house that the war seems to be closing in on us, and it, with each visit, and they actually are, aren't they? They are. Yeah, we're literally moving them closer together. Yeah. Um, I've thrown out a lot of stuff. Hey, we've talked about this. I've thrown out many things. Yeah. In fact, all my diaries and all the letters from him and photographs are in that box behind you, um, which I. I know. Uh, they're sealed up in like envelopes that, that say, don't open this. <laughs> That's got that covered. <laughs> <laughs> You're a genius. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> you put like a code on them so you can't get in without that. No, that's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, I don't know where the key to that box is. Um, so that's kind of a, a security. Um, one of the things I've realised when, while clearing out a lot of stuff and right, sorting out a lot of things in my house in general is that I, I don't remember the past. I don't mm. have these things. Um, so any object that I've got is a piece of external memory that when I look at it or I read it or I just hold it, and that's what a lot of these books are. I don't, they have some kind of, they're not like emotional memories, but they're memories of things. And when I have that object, I can remember the thing. And if I don't have the object, I don't, it's gone. Um, and so even though these are, these are bad things, un unquestionably, they're also so intimately tied into 
not even good stuff, but stuff that is me and these things are also me, um, that if I get rid of them, then all of that's probably gone. Yeah. Because I won't remember it. Yeah, I've I've tried that. I you know sort of test it in, in limited ways. It just won't be there. And then if in twenty years time I have another mental relapse, I'm like, oh my god, what the what the hell happened? Why am I feeling upset again? I won't have this stuff to fall back on. Mm. Doesn't take up much space. <laughs> Fits in a box. <laughs> also it's over there. It is right yeah. there. Well, there's some other stuff in there too. Um no, not good at destroying that stuff. I I've, I've I've too much of my memory has already been destroyed to destroy right. the bits that I've got left, I think. And do you think it's like an ongoing thing where you're trying to piece the whole thing together and try and pull one edge to the other? And it was it was while I was doing that. I've, I've, it's not a project I've tried to continue. You know, I think during cancer, I got to the point where you know I grasped enough of it to go, oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> this isn't going to help. Um, yeah, it helped. It helped to get perspective and scope. You know, to know like well, how many years was I being abused for? For example, yeah, you know, it's not like it's from like five onwards. Yeah, this is uh, early teenage to mid teenage, but because it also feels so massive, that, that felt like that could have been decades. Mm. Knowing that actually it's confined to only a couple of years and had to be, you know, by the sheer logic of calendar, that's that's quite reassuring. Mm. Yeah, where did you get to with the counselor? Did um. We, I mean, it just worries me the fact that you you open something up and then I don't know how many sessions you have but I know mm. it's limited isn't it yeah it and was go, mm. the door's that way <laughs> good luck <laughs> yeah there's certainly animals there and partly that's why, why I went at it so aggressively mm. yeah knowing that I was going to be very upset by it it was going to be very traumatic um, yeah we would get through everything I think the final session we went through photos right it's, it might be one of the things I printed out um because we'd done, I think we'd done letters, we'd done diary entries. At the end of it, yeah, I felt like we'd we'd covered a lot, and I'd, I'd remember. I'm not remembered isn't isn't quite the right word. I placed events in a way that was coherent, even if not necessarily accurate, or or at least in an order that I could live with. And since it was the first time I'd, I'd said most of these things out loud. That was significant and felt different from just having it written down, or just thinking about it, or just like screaming about it, just inside my head. So we ended. We, we it ended. I chose not to have a final session. Um, eventually, because I was like, "Well, we've done all this stuff," and I felt different. I don't know where. I don't know whether that lasted. I guess it has lasted. I don't think about this stuff in the same way. It's changed slightly, isn't it? Because sarcastically, I mean, you, mm. you're not being able to talk about it, only showing people on a piece of paper, and now doing a podcast. There is a significant difference. Yeah, I'm not two. thinking about the fact I've got a microphone <laughs> in front of me. Um, <laughs> a great deal. I don't know. Yeah, no, I know. Well, the, well, when I was when I was in counselling, I maintained an online blog, which is what these things are printed off from, which I sent to a very select number of people, um, to people very close to, who are like. Fucks up with you, man. Well, um, <laughs> thank you for being very supportive. Now you can read this screaming rant if you want to. Um, and part of that was uh, an intentional way of forcing myself to write about it. Writing's an act of cogitation um, and self reflection, which I found invaluable. Uh, and so, how, knowing that other people were reading it as well was useful. It's all public now. It's just not. You have to go. You'd have to go. You'd have to know where to find it, really. Yeah. Um, so I guess it's a natural next step, I suppose, from that. Maybe. You want to read another bit? Yeah. yeah. Da da da. I, this, this, I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm going to read you a, sing, a single paragraph from this one because I think you'll appreciate it based on what I've just said. I am one of those people who are unable to throw anything away. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd like that. Um, I think it's pathological. <laughs> and it, <laughs> it's not logical, that's no, for sure. No, no. <laughs> In addition to my diaries, a million flyers and birthday cards and cinema tickets. I cut every letter I've ever received. No, not not bank statements or bills, but everything else. So I got birthday cards and letters from Rick during that year between him moving to Amsterdam and me going to visit. The temptation to add fateful or similar is strong, but I don't want to turn this into a TV melodrama. Like everything else, I kept them tightly bundled up and enveloped, not wishing to accidentally expose myself to them. Well, 
that changed on Monday. The letters are dated, obviously. So I thought I might be able to add some bits into my timeline. However, I couldn't figure out the postmark timestamp, so I just opened them. In retrospect, that just shows me how tense I was. Never mind that I nearly cracked a tooth during the session. Uh, I apparently couldn't work out the DDMM in Roman numerals system, uh, because uh, idiot. Honestly, I found them horrifying. They're friendly, joking, encouraging. The sort of less you'd hope to get to cheer you up. It's funny, it's just not how you feel now. Just the sight of his handwriting sent blades of pain through me. The type letters are fractionally better, despite the odd bubble jet printer feel. The italic habit is weird. But these are just distractions. Why I found them so hard to read, and I'll be honest, I grabbed the dates from all of them, which allowed me to instantly not read the last letter. That's definitely from a much later day. And just read the first two. I don't know, this is hard to express. Second try. The letters make me remember Rick as a friend. That's what I wanted him to be, and found to be worthwhile. We all need friends, but he chose to ruin that. I think, on reflection, he'd always planned to. If it weren't for whatever the fuck is wrong with these people, we could still be friends. I could always have used... Ah! Where's the next page? <laughs> Apologies. I could always have used an extra uncle or mentor. But I know what happened, both before and after these letters. I received them during a year of peace, in which Rick was out of the country and I was untouched. Rereading the letters, I'm vividly cast back to the mental states that I experienced as a teenager. Torn between admiration and affection for this really interesting man who treated me like an adult. I, that ought to be a massive red light right there. And the discomfort, pain and fear for this man who abused me despite that. Who dismissed the trust that I placed in him, made me lie for him, trapped me and fucked up my head for 20 years. I suppose it's a kind of cognitive dissonance or optical illusion. When I read the letters, my mind is just popping back and forth between affection and the most fucked up thoughts follow. Maybe I was in the wrong. I really blew that out of proportion. This is clearly just a guy who's gotten confused about the boundaries. And then I just snapped back to the memory of what really happened. It felt fucking awful. That was when I nearly cracked a tooth clenching my jaw so tight. I should chew gum in future sessions. I felt incredibly disoriented, nauseous and angry. It's a confusing combination. But it's interesting too. Read them now, I can see that the tone of the letters is way too familiar. They're like something I might say to a friend of the same age, maybe. They're also signed off with love, which almost made me vomit. The thing is, and it still gets me now, they're nice letters. And that's where the dissonance arises. It kicks back in when I realise that I'm sitting in a counsellor's office, forcing myself to read through this, and it puts pain in my body and mind, and then flips again. It's precisely like being groomed to begin with, with neatly encapsulated in letter form. Stop the one I was going to read, but uh, <laughs> see the one that I read. Weird things. That's why I keep the letters, because you can then not that I'm looking for dissonance, but then I can I can go back and see that. I can see the friend that I had at the same time as someone who was abusing me. It's, it's very confusing. Do you, do you um I always find for myself not on any level like that, that if I vocalise something that's really bad for me, mm. I do feel better for it. And and it, as time goes on and, and keep vocalising, does, does that... I mean, it must help, must not it? It does, yeah. And the process of going through the counselling and, and reading the stuff and then writing about it later and then sharing it and then talking about it, it does. It It's... Um, it reminds me a lot of the stuff they're doing with um, PTSD and anxiety with magic mushrooms and stuff where they're using that to put you... Sorry, let's jump back a step. Basically, whenever we remember something, we're remembering the last time we remembered it. And we remember it a little bit less well each time. So these things do fade with recollection and revisiting. The idea of doing it with like with, with doing it in counseling with um, mushrooms and I think ecstasy as well is they were t to putting people in a non emotional state where you're slightly emotionally detached to revisit the memories so that when you then come back to them again, the last time you visited that memory, you were slightly emotionally detached and yeah. you're not as connected to it. And I think that's like a magnification of or a, an intensification of the process that I've found through going through this process that each time I re revisit it. I'm remembering less the original event and the feelings around that 
Uh, and in reading them now, I'm sympathising with my 34-year-old self more than anything else. Again, ah, oh, now I'm, I'm remembering how, or, or rather, I'm remembering from this account how stressful it was going through the counselling process, and that feels almost more important than the thing that happened, or it does right now. I think, yeah, so it's sl- it's slowly eroding the emotional connection yeah. and the emotional intensity, I guess. I should do more screaming on clifftops. Hmm. Have you ever stopped to think about yourself or where you are? And, you know, because, I, I mean, I, I don't know. You, you, you can only imagine in a very small way having to go through that. And, you know, you, you talked about before about this whole friend of yours and then the, the extent of friendship bit and then mm. the non-friendship bit. But, you're, you know, you're one of those people that uh, is pretty open with lots of people even without any real uh intro to it i find you you open with strangers in, in a way that mm. n- not not in a you know the like instantly best friends like, like you, the unnecessary bus stop conversation way <laughs> you, well, you, you just you, you you don't really seem to your initial guard doesn't seem to be there you're pretty mm. confident i think i think i'm fairly confident i, I feel like i'm guarded um takes a while to let people in in context i've never understood to the point where people shift from random strangers to friends yeah. uh yeah, hiding this stuff doesn't help doesn't help me doesn't help anyone else um one of the, one of the reasons for writing about it for doing the podcast of course is to normalize this stuff or normalize not 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 normalize abusing people that it's not good, um, but no. <laughs> we all knew that. <laughs> <laughs> what a wonderful outcome for a Most podcast! Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. That'd be an amazing fly, wouldn't it? Have you? Th- um, <laughs> oh. But but normalising the fact that bad things happen to people, and it um, should be a conversation that's e- easier to have than it has been. Yeah, and it, not yeah, for the individual. I mean, yeah, and uh, yeah, and it, it's not a you know high tea chat or whatever. But <laughs> it, it, I think what's important is that we should be able to find time and spaces to have these conversations. They shouldn't necessarily be in the pub with a bunch of strangers, though maybe that's a good time for some people. Yeah. Um, but it should be possible to have these conversations and to normalise feeling really messed up about our past and our emotional states and how hard it is to actually define your emotional states and live with yourself. Do you find that you can talk all those people that you were close to mm. who you couldn't talk to, can you talk to them now, Matthew? Has that changed? More so. Um, yeah, I've spoken to both my parents about this stuff, my siblings a little bit less so. Um, having gone through it, I find less need for me to talk about it, I guess. Um, I just would think that they would probably have a million questions in their head. Wouldn't they? Yeah, and they do. I, I, I wrote at some point during this, uh, during this process, I wrote to both of my parents to explain what had happened because they didn't know. And my dad knew a little bit earlier. Um, I can't quite remember how. There's, there's some other entry about how I randomly went through some of this again in like 2004. Got no recollection of it. Um, but obviously enough to tell dad something. Um, but I have no idea what. Hmm, gaps. <laughs> I don't know what they are. Um, and that obviously prompted some conversations. Difficult thing to write a letter for. Um, knowing that you're going to turn someone else's life upside down a little bit. Because mm. um, obviously that's not really what anyone wants for their kid. Um, so that all came with an apology as well. I didn't really want to be doing this to you either. Um, but they didn't know at the time. Um, yeah, I was very much all alone. Um, so being able to share that later was sort of good. Didn't make me feel less alone at the time. And I'm sure there's guilt that I can't erase, but there's nothing. There's, no, there's no way they could have known either. Mm. Yeah, you know, pe- these people are good at this stuff. You know, this is uh, that's why. Yeah, a lot of what I had to go through. There's some of these entries are about what it is to be a victim and what it is to be preyed upon. Um, and a lot of the shifting in my head was from, oh, he was just a mate, and the you know, stuff went wrong. It's like these things don't happen by accident. These things don't. This is intentional stuff. And then there's like, a, we looked at what we know about him, this pattern of moving around, of having these close, intense relationships with a series of boys about the same age, some of whom I'd met in the past. You're like, this is, this is habitual. This is, this is predatory. This is, you know, 
this is intentional. And that was useful too. Um, feels worse in a way. You know, uh, but knowing that this isn't, I've not got things the wrong way around. I've not made a mistake. This is, this is, this is intentional grooming behavior and stuff. Uh, it's useful. Weird. So not sure how I feel about that. Yeah. What was that? What was the question? Uh, I feel like I've drifted from it. <laughs> I just, I just wonder whether I, I guess there was, you know, you obviously have problems uh, talking to people about mm. it, uh, which is the understatement of the year. Um, I just wonder whether that had been dealt with, you know, because I, I know it, it's, mm. um, you know, they must have had lots of ongoing thoughts in their head all the time and, and it would almost get to the point where it's, do you know what I mean? You've it's not about them, it's about you. Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah, and again, I got I got big holes. This is this is still this is still ten years ago, so I got huge holes around this anyway, which is why these notes are so valuable. I got I don't I remember seeing my mum afterwards, but I don't remember what we talked about. Right. Have you got a plan going forward with it all in terms of trying to put it more together, or are you? No, just... I don't think so. Um, this stuff comes up; it comes up less and less with time. Um, I think it's important to remember it because these these are things that have made me who I am, for better or for worse. Yeah, or yeah, I'm not saying that. Maybe if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. That's not true. Mm. Uh, if it doesn't kill you, it permanently weakens you and damages you in ways that are invisible to others. Um, but it's it's what uh, I'm trying to, I don't know how to rephrase it. Um, these events are things that then inform how I react to other to people and to other issues when they come up. Um, it's a horrific experience. It's going to have an effect on your outlook. Yeah. Yeah. You well, know, yeah, yeah. And and, but, and, and that's, that's what it's useful to look at because it's it, it's good to have some concept of why it is that you respond badly to things. Um, yeah, you know, or, or, or why you're you're less or more likely to. I, I'm trying to think of a, like a concrete example. I'm not sure. I... I'm, I'm all right talking about this. I'm, I'm less, I'm less good talking about, I guess, my emotional states on d- at different times, maybe, because my, because I'm predicated on like I will keep this, I will keep these things secret. So knowing that, I, knowing that, you know, the my past is kept secret, my natural inclination is to keep other things secret. Um, but knowing that that is my inclination means I can fight against it, because I know it doesn't serve a purpose. In fact, having these things secret was probably the worst thing about it all put together. Mm. Yeah, had it been known and open it wouldn't all have been so bad. So there are lessons. And I guess if I forget the lesson, I won't. If I forget the teaching, I won't remember the lesson. I don't know, something like that. The answer. I, I don't know. Mm. Um, we're going to have to wrap up, which is, yeah. seems like a terrible thing to say. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know how you feel about it. And, and you know, you're one of my best friends. I'm quite worried about how you feel about <laughs> it. But, but I think if you're all right with it, we should keep it open that maybe in some point in the future it would be good to, to come back to if you wanted to yeah or yeah. not or not or never yeah. think of it again yeah. um i i think i would be open to that i think that it's genuinely interesting looking back. one of the great things about diaries is that you get to read an earlier version of yourself um you get to see yourself as a character and to and to say and interact with a younger version of yourself because we're, we're only whoever we are you know right now but i can read the 15 year old me and the 34 year old me and I can be sympathetic to their situation mm. while recognizing that I'm not that person anymore. I've changed from that and I've grown from it, but still know that that was part of the road for getting here. And I'll be able to do the same in 20 years' time listening to this. Mm. Strange. We should wrap it up, shouldn't we? Sure. Let's do that. Yeah. I don't have any closing thoughts. Um, Nope. <laughs> um, write stuff down. Keep it. Don't throw things away. <laughs> I mean, I, I do think that the one that we always come back to, no matter what we talk about, is just this avenue of having to being able to have conversations with people. Isn't it? That's the crux of it. And I think the yeah. thing I'm take away from it is just just the friendship I've got with you and the friends I know and stuff. Because I just I feel thinking about that younger version of you without mm. people you could turn to, and I think now. You as well. You've got so many people around you now. It's nice. We're in such a better place. Um, and that's good. 
Also surrounded by books currently, which is even better. Y- yes. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's go. To minimize that further. Mm-hmm. Let's go to the pub yeah. or something. All right, that sounds good. All anyway, right. Anyway, it's been uh, We Are What We Overcome, and we shall be back next time. Uh, see you soon. Take care. If you've been affected by anything that we've talked about tonight, that's cool. We were kind of hoping you would be. If you haven't been affected by anything tonight, then that's great too. You're probably fine. Of course, if you say you're fine, there's a good chance you aren't. So you might also have been affected. And if you've been affected before, you probably will be again. Please talk to someone. It can get better, and together we can survive. We are what we overcome. Some big strong.